Well, good morning. It is great to be back with you in Kooky, California. And uh, I wanted to start with just giving you a recap of the trip and thanking you for the opportunity uh, to go to Kenya again. Uh, last June, I went with some elders and leaders of our church to just go and witness what God was doing in Ethiopia and Kenya amidst our partners in ministry there. Um, and when I got there um, in Kenya, what I saw God doing through Mohi, Missions of Hope International, where not just lives were changed, but in, entire communities were changed. Like I just really felt like I had to go back and bring some friends that I had met throughout the Chino Valley. For the last three years, you've kind of enabled me, equipped me, empowered me to go build relationships with pastors within our 10 mile radius for the purpose of encouraging them, equipping them, empowering them more in their ministry, but also in hopes that God might do something with all of us together, something better together than we could ever do apart. And when I was in Kenya last June, uh, the leaders of Mohi talked about a community named Shambini and uh, how they had leaders there and the community was ready, but there was no one to pay for the work. There was no one to support it, no one to undergird it. And I just felt like, man, that's, that's what God has for us. So I came back and talked to a number of my uh, pastor friends here in the Chino Valley and told them about this work. And uh, so we went. We went to Kenya and a group of churches, here's a uh, logos of churches. So our church, the Bridge Church, Cross Point Church, Bethany Montclair couldn't come, but they're partnering with us in the work. Transformation Church, Upward Call Church, Southland. So a bunch of pastors came and man, we not only had a great time, but we saw God doing incredible things. And when everything was said and done, we broke ground for a new church and a new school in Shambini, uh, the southeast part of Kenya. Shambini is not only, yeah, you're going to Applause for that. Um, Shambini is a, is a community on the coast of Kenya. There's extreme poverty. Um, there is just harsh living conditions. Uh, and they're a nominal Muslim community. But that community welcomed Jesus in their community. They welcomed Mohi in the community. And they and other pastors from the area came and prayed. And when we broke ground, I mean, to see all these other pastors from our community breaking through the hard soil, turning it over and dedicating it to the Lord and praying that God would do a powerful work. I got to tell you, it was incredible to be there. It was a momentous occasion in my life, but it was also a miraculous moment in my life. And, and I was coming back thinking, that's, that's why I love missions. Because missions allows us an opportunity not just to partner with what God is doing around the world, but to see something greater. See, sometimes we just picture that God's focusing on our lives, but the very thing that God's doing here, God is doing everywhere. And when you get a moment to see it, all of a sudden we get smaller and God gets bigger. So that's why every year we encourage you to prayerfully consider joining a mission trip. Uh, two purposes, really, for these mission trips. Number one, to partner with what, the God, what the, uh, God is doing in his kingdom around the world. But secondly, because of what God does in you and through you as a result. Uh, there's still time for you to apply for these trips. We have a trip to Ecuador, Moldova, Estonia, and Central California. There's still time. Uh, you got to fill out those applications to get them in by the end of the month. If you need help finding the applications, there should be some at the information center. You can also find them on the app. You can also find them on the webpage. But I want to encourage you, like at CVCC, I know, or like, ah, eh, Brian, Brian will fit us in. It's really important if you can help me out. Get those in by the end of the month. Uh, that way we know what we're dealing with and how we can partner with you in getting where God may be calling you to go. Now that we've uh, talked about missions and now that I've pushed you to go and have this great experience, this question popped in my mind this week. Is a specific experience necessary for your spiritual growth? 
Like, do you need to go on a mission trip in order to grow in your spiritual maturity? Do you need to have a certain experience with God in order to have this confirmation of faith? Is there some form of experience that you need in order to grow in the image of Jesus? You know, because... Because if we're not careful, we might think that the Apostle Peter was telling us yes. You know, the first uh, chapter of 2 Peter, Peter is talking to us about con- confirmation of our faith. He wants us to be confident in what not only Jesus accomplished in our lives through justification, but what Jesus is still at work accomplishing in our lives, whittling away the sin in our lives and filling us with more and more the characteristics of Christ. And Peter wants us to be confident in the work of Jesus Christ in our lives to the point where he said this. Look at what he said in verse 16. He says, we do not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Cleverly devised. We're not following uh, something that's contrived, something that's spun for success, something that's creatively built. We're not following a myth, a fable, a story. Peter says, I want you to be confident in who you are in Christ and and what we're telling you is not just some specially crafted fable. And then Peter went into an experience, right? He went into the Mount of Transfiguration experience where Peter says, listen, I know this is true. I was there on the mountain. And Brett did a great job talking about that last week. Didn't Brett do a great job the last two weeks? Man, what a blessing it is to have elders in our church who can faithfully preach the word of God. And the Apostle Peter said, I want you to be confident in your faith, not only what Jesus is doing in your life, but what he has already accomplished in your life. And Peter says, listen, I'm confident. I saw something miraculous on the Temple Mount. But that's not where Peter's confidence comes. See, if we're not careful, we begin to think that Peter is saying experience is everything. And that's not what he's saying at all. Peter is saying as much as that experience was important, what it did was it proved the power of Scripture. Man, you want to grow in your faith. You want to be developed in spiritual growth. You want to grow in the image of Jesus and have this budding confidence in who you are in Christ. It's not based in experience, but rooted in Scripture. If you have your Bibles, you can join me in the book of 2 Peter. It's actually the second letter of Peter. If you haven't been there before, just go to the back of your Bible and then just start flipping to the left. You'll find it. If you hit 1 Peter, you went too far. Go back. 2 Peter We're going to start in verse 19. See, after Peter is firm about what Jesus has accomplished in you through justification, after Peter has discussed everything that Jesus is still doing in you in sanctification, ridding your life of more and more sin, and filling it with more and more of the characteristics of him, he went in and talked about this great experience he had on the mountaintop, but then look at verse 19. He said, so... We have the prophetic word made more sure to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. But know this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For, so, for no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Verse 19 begins with this term, so. Here where Peter's like, listen, I had this great experience, but what this experience did was just prove to me what the Bible had already said. He said this, so we have the prophetic word made more sure. A term made more sure. Uh, It's a comparative term, meaning scripture is better. Scripture is bigger. Scripture is more secure. All the experience that Peter had, all it did was make, make the Bible more certain, more verified. It built confidence 
in Peter's life. So Peter is saying, listen, I want you to be confident in your faith. And I had this experience that none of you are ever going to have. And here's what it did in my life. It gave me confidence that everything that the scripture said is true. Peter isn't saying base your faith in experience. He's saying base, base your experience on scripture. And then he goes into three truths about the Bible. Three truths on why you can have confidence in Scripture and why you can have confidence in your faith because of Scripture. First truth is this, because it's proven. Because it's proven. The Word of God is proven. Look at this. Look at verse 19. It says, we have the prophetic word made sure It's confident, it's reliable. Everything that the Bible said was going to happen has happened. Here's some Old Testament uh, prophecies that he's talking about. Look at Isaiah 7, 14. This is all before Jesus was even born. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, surprise, a virgin will be with child and bear a son and she will call his name Emmanuel. Look at what it says later in that book, Isaiah 53. He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities, the chastening for our well-being, being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed, continues. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that was led to the slaughter, like a sheep that is silent before its shears. So he did not open his mouth. Past continue. His grave was assigned with a wicked man, he was with a rich man in his death because he had, not, he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Look at another Old Testament prophecy, Micah 5.2. But as for you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you, one will go forth from me to be ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. Peter's like, listen, Scripture, everything that I witnessed in life, Peter says, All it does is confirm and prove the accuracy of Scripture. The first truth you got to know about the Bible. The Bible is proven. The Bible is proven. It's not just proven about Jesus. The Bible has been proven archaeologically. I was doing some research this week, and something snuck by most of us including myself, because of COVID and all the drama and culture, there was this enormous thing that happened in September of 2021. September 2021, there was this paper that was published. There was a paper published that was the result of over two decades of work that was peer-reviewed and it involved 21 scientists all bringing in their specialties into this one aspect of life. September 2021. And it began with them looking at this one city. They wanted to find this one particular city around the Red Sea and they used the Bible to give them some specific area of where to find it. And when they found this site, they began to dig and excavate. And what they found was a four-foot pile of soot. Within the soot were, were broken pieces of bone and pottery and brick. But there was something specific on the brick. See, one side had this glaze on it. The glaze that was only produced through extreme heat in a very short period of time. It resembled the sands of New Mexico when they were um, trying out all those, um, well, what's the nuclear, nuclear things, right? The atomic bomb. And so what they found is how did this pottery get this glaze when the technology and that type of heat wasn't available for 24 centuries after? See, what they found was Sodom. They found the city of Sodom. Remember that story? city so wicked that God just destroyed it. And these scientists didn't set out to prove scripture. They used scripture to help find the city. And then they dug and what they found, four foot layers of just soot. 
with pieces of pottery that had been touched with such high heat that wasn't available until 24 centuries later. They could only decide that that maybe it was from a meteor. Maybe a meteor did it, but there's no crater. Maybe a volcano did it, but volcanoes don't get so hot. Here's how it ended. The paper concluded that what happened to Sodom bears inescapable parallels to what the Bible described in the Genesis account. Man, and it had to have pained them to write that. (laughs) Man, what I want you to know, the same scripture that's been proven over and over again about who Jesus is. It's been proven over and over again through archaeology. Man, it's that same scripture that has said that your sins can be forgiven through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So same scripture said that Jesus is divine son of God, the creator of everything, who built everything out of nothing. It's that same scripture that promises an eternal security when you accept the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Peter's message to you, to good people who love Jesus back then in their kooky culture, to people who love Jesus today and ours. Man, you and I, you can have confidence in your faith, not based on your experience, based on this scripture, the word of God. First reason it's proven. But Peter's not done talking about it. Look what else he says. He says, so we have the prophetic word made more sure. All of my experience, all it did is root me down to a greater confidence in what the Bible already said. But then he keeps going in verse 19. To which, look at this, to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place. I love how Peter says it. He says, you'll do well to pay attention. Pay attention means to bring ourselves near to the Bible, to turn our eyes towards the Bible, to be on the alert for what the Bible says. And he says, you'd do well to do it. You'd be correct. You'd be accurate. You'd be right. You'd be intelligent. You'd be smart. Listen, the smart thing for you is to turn all of your attention to Scripture. The foolish thing to do would be to cast it aside and look for your experience. Peter's saying, listen, this is a smart thing to do. The right thing to do. You want to root your faith. You want to have confidence in the midst of a kooky culture. This is your answer. Not only is it proven, but it's powerful. Look at this. He said, you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place. A term dark, it describes something that's murky and disorienting. I don't know about you, but uh, one of the challenges that I face when I travel is in the middle of the night when I wake up, I'm disoriented. I, after traveling at so diff- many different places and being at a different place so many different nights and, and there's no night lights, light, right, in Africa. And so you wake up in the dark and I'm disoriented. And so I've learned to have my flashlight next to my bed or my phone. So when I wake up and I can't remember where I am, I just turn on the flashlight and look around. And I hate being disoriented. I feel lost, powerless, anxious. But once I turn the light on and recognize my surroundings, this peace just comes around And I'm able to drift back off to sleep. The Bible says, you know what? The, The word of God, it's like that in culture. See, culture is a dark and murky place. It can be difficult to get your bearings. Seems like everybody around you is pursuing money and power. But the Bible serves as a light says you no 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 you're supposed to be out service and humility the first will be last but the last will be first man it can be challenging and difficult to get your bearings in relationship because all culture pushes at you as sex but but the bible the bible's trying to shine light on something deeper 
on the power of a relationship where you bring self-control and respect, submission and godly characteristics in a relationship. Man, it could be hard to get your bearings when everyone's fighting for control or elections all over the world bring out the worst in people. But the Bible tells you God's already got everything in the palm of his hands or all world authorities submit to him. Peter says it can be disorienting when you live in a kooky culture where if you stand for Jesus, you get persecuted, but if, if you reject Jesus, you get comfort. But the Bible reminds you, exhorts you, and empowers you to look through all of that murk and mire and see the truth. See, Peter, after all of his experience, says, you know what, yeah, it was great. I saw some miraculous, amazing, incredible things, but all it did was confirm the power of Scripture. It's proven time and time again. Man, it's powerful. It functions like a light to your feet. Isn't that what Psalms 119 says? Look at this, Psalm 119. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. See, it's not just Peter that thinks that. It's not just the psalmist that thinks that. It's also Paul. Paul has this powerful passage that talks about the power of Scripture. Man, it's not just proven, but it's powerful. This is not just some dead textbook. This is a living, breathing act word of God that has powerful influence on your life where it ought to. Do me a favor, put your thumb in 2 Peter and flip over a little bit to the book of 2 Timothy. Shouldn't have to flip too far. Book of 2 Timothy chapter 3. We've gone over this before, but I want to remind you again. See, it's not just Peter who says experience is great, but scripture is foundational. It's not just a psalmist, but it's the Apostle Paul as well. Look at what he says, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. It says this, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable, meaning, man, it pays dividends. It has this positive impact on your life. Man, it is profitable. This is what it does. Number one, it teaches. The term teach, it isn't focused so much on how one teaches, but what one teaches. Man, this is the truth of God. All scripture is inspired by God and it's beneficial to give us truth. Man, I was thinking this week how easy it is for us to rely on everyone else's truth, right? We look to TV personalities to tell us how to behave, athletes to tell us what to purchase. We look at politicians to tell us how to live. We listen to our friends, we look at trends, we look at what's popular. I mean, you know what, even when we're looking for truth, we don't even look at truth in the Bible for ourselves. We want someone else to give us the truth. So we listen to Christian authors to tell us what they think the truth is. We listen to Christian speakers and podcasts so they tell us what the truth is. Man, you want truth? It's right here. This is the only source where you can get divine truth without spin, without packaging, without worry of what are their alternative motives. Scripture is profitable for teaching, for truth. Look at this next one. For reproof, that term reproof means to rebuke, to confront error in our hearts, in our lives. This is not some quiet, passive book, man. When you get in it, it takes your lies it takes your greed, it shreds them to pieces. Man, so often we tend to view Scripture as a hammer to beat culture into submission. 
But Paul says, no, 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 the Bible is more like a scalpel that God uses to carve the sin out of your own soul so you can bring healing to your life. And the Bible says, man, or Paul says, the Bible's powerful. And it only contains divine truth, but it confronts you. It confronts your sins. It confronts your errors. You know, so often, like, Brian, I just don't know how to respond to someone who's in the midst of sin. Well, why don't you lead them to Scripture? Man, Scripture is powerful. It's the Word of God that He uses to carve sin out of our soul and bring healing to our hearts. Look what else it does. Not only teaching, reproof, but for correction. That term correction means to straighten or restore. See, oftentimes when we're confronted by truth and he cuts sin out of our hearts, we're tempted to land in shame and fear and to hide from everyone else and from God. But this is what the Bible does. See, Bible, now once it confronts your sin, it restores your path back to God. Reminds you of his grace. The Bible says that you have a high priest who sympathizes with your weakness so you can go to the throne of grace boldly, confidently. Man, the scripture isn't just there to carve sin out of your life, but to plan a pathway back to God so you can have communion and peaceful relationship with him once again. The Bible doesn't just shred your sin, but he restores you back to a right relationship with him. All scriptures inspired by God and profitable, powerful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. That term train means the Bible cultivates your spiritual growth. It coaches your spiritual life day by day. You know, I was thinking, a common trend in our culture right now is a life coach. These are people who are trained to to help guide you in the future, to navigate your present, and to maybe heal from your past, to coach you in your life. And I'm not casting any stones to them. I think they can have great power and influence in our lives, but I just want to make sure you know the Bible. It's a free version of that. Sometimes we need someone else to go along the journey, but the Bible is your life coach. It trains you in righteousness. Man, you're struggling in how to be a dad. As a new father, when I struggled, I'd look everywhere. But here. Man, dads, this gives you the characteristics of God to grow in your heart so that you can not only survive the pressure of fatherhood, but be successful in passing on characteristics of Jesus to your sons and your daughters. It's training on how to live in a kooky culture. It coaches you on that. I think as you read the Bible, you recognize that most people who live to follow the Lord did so in a kooky culture. In fact, I can't come up with any ideas of where everyone lived in a culture where everything was great. Scripture is your life coach. Hey, it's powerful. And look at the result of it. Look what he says, verse 17. So that, Scripture is so powerful, so that the man of God may be adequate and equipped for every good work. Not most good works. Oh, I don't know, Brian. The Bible doesn't address these specific issues of our day. Well, according to the Bible, it gives you everything that you could be adequate and equipped. And adequate in the Bible doesn't mean, eh, you can be average. Adequate means you have everything you need. In every single aspect of your life, man, you're struggling in confidence, not just in your faith, but how to be a person of faith within an, an aspect of your life. Peter, Paul, King David, the psalmist, man, all of them come to you and say, the answers are here. We're tempted to buy books. We're tempted to pursue experiences. We're tempted to have some sort of extra thing. 
Peter draws our attention. It's got to be rooted in Scripture. Why? It's proven. Man, Scripture is powerful. And lastly, it's provided by God himself for you. Man, you want to know the biggest reason why we should root our faith in Scripture? It's because God himself gave it to you for that very reason. Look how it continues, verse 20. Paul says, but know this first of all, no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation for no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will. Listen, this scripture is not built based on people saying, you know what? Let's write a huge book to tell people how to live for the Lord and we're going to have dozens and dozens of different authors written over thousands of years set apart and it's going to combine together to form this divinely inspired uh, work that will guide people in faith and practice. Peter said, that's not how it happened. No prophecy was ever made by an act of human will. No one set out to write this. But, huge biblical but right there. Big biblical but. But, how it came to be men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. The term move means to be driven along or progressed intentionally. The imagery, the picture that people like to use to describe what that means is you have a sailboat with a sail and the Holy Spirit blows and fills that sail and moves the boat forward. Man, no scripture has just come up by men. This isn't man's idea. There's are men writing under the propelling power of the Holy Spirit, filling their sails and moving them forward in the direction he desires. Going back to what, how Paul described it, he, used, uh, he described it much the same way. Look at 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is inspired by God. Man, I love that term inspired in the Greek. It's theonoustos. Theo meaning God. Noustos meaning breathed. Breathed. Man, scripture is God's breath. So you take Peter's term of moving along through the Holy Spirit, through the breath of the Holy Spirit, Paul says it's inspired Theonustos, the breath of God filling the sails of these men's lives and hearts, progressing them forward in writing scripture. Man, no wonder the Bible is so powerful. Man, you can root your faith in it. No wonder it's been proven time and time and time and time again. Because it's the theonustos, it's the breath of God moving along human authors to give his truth. No wonder it's so powerful. No wonder it can guide your path no matter what aspect you find yourself and root you in confidence in your faith because it is the theonoustos, the breath of God moving along to give you what you need. Unless you feel that you're ever alone, that God has abandoned you in Southern California in the most crazy culture ever existing in human nature, you're not alone because you have his word. I think as a culture, we so aggrandize experience, how I feel, what I've seen. The Apostle Peter says, you want to have confidence in your faith. Do you want to grow in the image of Jesus Christ? Do you want to know direction and how to live in a kooky culture like ours? Don't read someone else's truth. Don't listen to someone else's message. Use them as resources if you want, but the foundation of your life and faith and practice is right here. Handcrafted and delivered to you by God himself.
Peter's heart, first chapter of this book, it's written towards Christians who are in the midst of a battle for themselves. There's corruption in government. There's division among churches. There's questions in people's souls, and people are just dropping from faith right and left. So the Apostle Peter wrote a note. Chapter 1 is just to give them confidence in who they are in Christ. Man, Jesus, he has paid all the consequences of your sin. It's already done if you accept it. Once you accept it, you enter into this sanctifying process where little by little the Holy Spirit rids your life of more and more sin and fills you with more and more of the characteristics of Christ. And the more you get in the word of God, the more confident and hearted and rooted you grow in your faith. The Apostle Peter's direction, encouragement, I think for us after one chapter, man, if you do anything, get in the word of God. Every day. Get in the word of God every day. And that's not a mandate from God. That's just wisdom. There's nowhere in the Bible that says you have to do it every day during your coffee. Take a picture of it. Put it on Instagram. That's man-made. No offense to those who do it. <laughs> Peter's heart, God's desire, get in my word. It's given to you. Man, you're going to have confidence in it. It's proven. Man, it is not just a living or a dead textbook. It is a living sword used by God to transform your life. And it's not something you need to fear or dread. It's a gift by God for you. Get in the word every day. I was thinking this week, we have three great resources on how to help you with that. Number one, we have great men's, women's Bible studies throughout the week. Man, sometimes it's easier to do stuff with other people. And if that's you, I'd encourage you to jump in in men's, women's Bible study. Now, I've been gone. I don't know if there's still space, but because I'm the senior pastor, I can just say this. We'll make room. <laughs> you want to show up at a men's or women's Bible study? We will have room for you. Because it is beneficial for all of us if you get rooted more in the Word of God. You need help finding a men's and women's Bible study? You can visit the information center. Just use a con uh, little comment card and seat back in front of you. Put your name, email address. Say you want to join a Bible study. We'll help you out. You're like, oh, Brian, I don't want to do a Bible study. I'd rather be in a small group. Fantastic. We have dozens and dozens of small groups where you can be a part. They meet in people's homes throughout the week at different times. Or you can study the word of God with others. Same thing applies. You need help finding a small group. Go to the information center. Use a comment card. We'll be happy to follow up and help you find a place. If you're like, Brian, I, I, my schedule's kind of nuts with my kids and work. I just need to do this on my own. Fantastic. So our office came up with a Bible reading plan I'd like to invite you to be a part of. You might be saying, well, Brian, it's February 11th. Like, how are you? That's weird. Where do we start? Just start on day one with me. You can find this Bible reading plan on the church app. If you download Chino Valley Community Church app, Bible reading plan, click it there, this great PDF. Not only will it outline out what passages to read, but it also has some really great background information if that's helpful for you. My encouragement, my invitation, join me every day in following along this plan by the end of the year. By February 11th, 2025, <laughs> we'll have gone through all of God's word together and the book of Psalms twice. If you're not in your word daily, do it with me. I'll hold you accountable, you hold me. This is a reading plan for you. Like, Brian, I don't want to download the app. I don't know how to work it. We'll have some printed copies out at the information center. I don't know if they're there now, but someone with a key will be able to get that done for you. Just go get it at the Welcome Center. Here's my request. Here's my encouragement. Here's Peter's direction. Here's God's desire. 
You don't want to grow in confidence in your faith. Root yourself in this book. Get to know it. You can trust it. It's proven. You need it. Man, it is powerful to change your life. And we should probably celebrate it more than we do. So it's the second greatest gift God's ever given. The first is his son. The second is his word. And I would probably say the third is a family like this to read the word with. One step you can take to get more into the word of God. Let's pray. Ah, God, we are grateful. I'm grateful, God, for your word, God, that you loved us to such a degree. You not only provided a way of salvation for us, but God, you provided a way of direction for us as well. So God, as Tyler prayed earlier, I asked you, open our eyes. Allow us to see you more clearly through your word. God, open our ears. As we read your word, we might hear your Holy Spirit convict us, empowering us, challenging us, growing us. God, I pray you open our heart that we would be open to making your word a more viable, influential, and powerful part of our lives. But God, we pray, help us to be more than just people who know your word. Help us to be people that do your word. So God, I pray you give us humility and confidence. God, that we might continue to be a church that's not only rooted in the scriptures, but God, directed by them as well. God, I pray now for all my friends. God, you know where we're at. Some of us are struggling with some pretty serious medical issues. So God, use your scriptures to comfort them. God, some are dealing with some serious sin issues that they're trying to turn their backs on and follow you. So God, I pray that you would encourage them, equip them and empower them in your grace and your mercy. God, there's some people here who are just struggling in fear, fear of the future, fear of the present. So God, as they try to place their faith and root it deeply in your word, May the peace of God that surpasses human comprehension guard their heart and their mind through Christ Jesus. God, we pray, we use your word to strengthen us, embolden us, comfort us. Whatever we have to deal with today, we pray everything in your name.